was going to review Overblood for this series, but that game is beyond terrible, so let's talk about what was one of my favourite games, Parasite Eve 2. Parasite Eve 2 was made by Square. These days Square might only make Final Fantasy games, but back then they made all sorts of stuff, from the mech strategy RPG front mission to the subject of this video. What makes Parasite Eve 2 stand out from other survival horror games is that it isn't a survival horror game. Sure, it has pre-rendered backgrounds, tank controls, puzzles and a spooky atmosphere, but it's more of an RPG. You kill monsters for experience points to unlock spells and for money that you can use to buy various weapons, armour and consumables. I think that might explain why the game got mediocre reviews back in the deer, but what surprised me a bit was that the game is still hated to this deer. Usually games that are unusual or misunderstood are at least appreciated years later, but not Parasite Eve 2. What's more, the complaints I see about the game tend to be that it's not the same as the first game. Something I personally don't care about, since I never really played the first game. It never got a UK release, and the only time I played it back in the day was on a friend's chipped PlayStation. The game was in black and white because it didn't have a SCART TV. Anyway, Parasite Eve 2 opens with a cool trailer made from clips of the game's great FMV sequences. This does have some spoilers in it, but you won't have context for them, so maybe that's okay. The game puts you in the shoes of Aya Bria, and no, I'm not going to get into arguments about the pronunciation. She's an FBI agent working for the secret Monster Hunter division, Mist. After a devastating monster attack on a skyscraper, you are sent to a small desert town to investigate some cattle mutilations. No prizes for guessing that the two are connected. The game looks great in that classic Resident Evil 2 sort of way. The character models and textures are fantastic, the pre-rendered backgrounds are great, and there's even dynamic lighting effects that are subtle but present on the character models themselves. One disappointing part of the presentation is the lack of voice acting. The game comes on two discs and some of the incidental lines are voiced, like a cop telling you to freeze or characters screaming or grunting. Excuse me, sir? Yes, come in. This isn't so bad if you look at the game as an RPG. It's also fair to say that there's a lot of talking in this game compared to something like Silent Hill or Resident Evil. Still, it would have been nice. The music, however, is good, helping create a spooky atmosphere when horror is required, or getting you pumped for a big boss fight. None of it is really the kind of thing that works outside of the game though, but it is a good fit within the game itself. At first glance, gameplay is classic tank controls, but from there it gets different. There's this hard split between being in combat and out. You can't access your inventory in combat and are limited to items that you assign to your belt, and the amount of belt space you have is determined by your armour. Running away is usually an option, but doing so is lightly penalised. There is a lock-on mechanic, an optional radar which is handy for shooting at enemies off screen, and damage numbers that appear above enemies when you shoot them. There's even critical hits and enemies will take extra damage in certain vulnerable states, such as being shot in the back or when leaping through the air. These states vary from enemy to enemy. Combat is skill based. You can avoid most damage in some way, from running around a charging enemy, to using certain spells, shooting them at the right time, what have you. Ammo isn't really rationed, vendors sell ammo at reasonable prices and boxes containing infinite 9mm rounds can be found lying around. Early on you'll lean on the free ammo a lot, but later in the game you're going to want something with a bit more punch. I'd also argue that the game is fairly well balanced. I personally lean on the fire spells a lot, especially the area of effect one that can attack enemies through walls. But I've seen others swear by power shot and necrosis, so... 
I guess it depends on your playstyle. To further hammer home how much of an RPG this is, when you hit a milestone, areas that you've explored will repopulate with new enemies, and these areas will be marked red on the map. You can hunt down all the monsters for extra experience and money, or just ignore them. The game is kind of self-balancing in its difficulty this way. You can grind to get better equipment and spells, or you can just beeline the plot and deal with the increased challenge that comes from not being as well prepared. The game's biggest flaw is that Aya is just so slow. She moves like a crate of bricks, sometimes feeling like her movement speed doesn't match her animation. Reloading is a bit slow as well, at least with some weapons, and getting interrupted means starting the whole animation over again. It's hard to notice, especially early on in the game, but as I progressed this got more and more of an annoyance. The same problem exists outside of combat, making any lengthy backtracking even more tedious, especially if you've cleared out all the monsters already. I'm playing the American version in these clips because it runs slightly faster. Not much faster, about 10 to 15% or so, and it doesn't fix the problem in combat as enemies also benefit from the CM speed boost, but it's something. I'll include a link in the description showing the speed difference. It's small but noticeable. Inventory management is different than Resident Evil. You have more spears, but it's easy to fill with junk. There are way more weapons, often with different ammo types, as well as various types of healing items. Some restore health, some cure status effects, some restore magic, etc. You can't sell things either, so when I come across some rare ammo for a weapon I didn't use, I'd take it back to storage just in case. Further adding to this is that item boxes are not linked like they are in Resident Evil. So if you put stuff in, say, the hotel cabinet, you have to go all the way back to the hotel cabinet to get those items. I know people mock Resident Evil for its item boxes being unrealistic, but I prefer that system to something like this, especially with Parasite Eve 2's slow movement speed. That said, individual items aren't as important here. You can easily leave ammo, healing, and even entire weapons to rot in the item boxes if you don't want to carry them around. And once you finish the game, you're still not done. There's a true ending to get, and on completion of the game, you unlock additional modes. Replay mode lets you play the game again, with a portion of the money and XP from previous playthroughs carrying over, as well as the shops having items that you've unlocked for you to buy. There's also a lot to unlock. There's also other modes. Scavenger mode greatly restricts supplies, bounty mode fills the game with high-end enemies, and nightmare mode is the game's super hard mode. I've beaten the game around 8 times, maybe more over the years, and it was one of my favourites, and despite my complaints, it still holds up well today.